What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and today I'm here with Gareth Coker, who is the composer for w one of my favorite uh, soundtracks, one of my favorite games, uh, Ori in the Blind Forest, even though I pronounced that first name wrong for the first, like, six months the game was out. I think I was calling it Ori. Ori, yeah. yes. And, I think I remember. We we actually, I think we we actually found out a lot of people that were, were calling it Ori, and I think I think you were one I, of them, I, actually, because we, we keep an eye on the, the social media. I was. There was a lot of people who were mad at me. Uh, and he's done... <laughs> A uh, game for in Insomniac, which is the Unspoken and Ark, and a couple other things as well as some TV movie kind of stuff. So I asked him to come on. He knows he knows the gist. He knows that it's a loose and laid back kind of interview. So for anybody who is just jumping into these, who are new to the channel, uh, occasionally there's not safe for 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 life uh, language. That's usually on my part. But what we're going to do is we're just going to sit down and talk about music and games, uh, music and life, and the composer himself. So why don't we, as always, this is the only thing that happens in all of them, all interviews, but why don't we just, you know, a little bit of an introduction about you and how you began. How far do you want me to go you back? Can, can go we right had back, Austin so. go back to, like, literally the first instrument he picked up. So... Feel okay, free. I, I guess I, that's that's uh, that's a good place to start. Um, so I got piano lessons from my parents at the age of eight, and I didn't particularly like them. Oh, <laughs> and then and then about four months <laughs> later, they shipped me off to boarding school, um, which. In America, when when you say the words boarding school, usually parents like shudder mm -hmm. um, because that's like a it's like a terrible punishment for children. In England, it's a little bit different. Boarding school is actually pretty oh, good, gotcha. um, but I just didn't know it at the time. Um, anyway. At boarding school, there's not very much to do. <laughs> so I just started practicing. And hey, what happens if you practice something for like three hours a day every day of right. the week? You're gonna you're you're just gonna get quite good at it. That's it's, especially if you're practicing efficiently and well. Um, so about eight years of that, and I'd finished all of the basic levels of piano that you can that you can take mm -hmm. in in England. Um, I picked up trumpet. I picked up trombone. Um, the reason why I started getting into it is because once I did my first live performance on piano, which is when I was like nine, uh, I guess my ego, even at nine years old, particularly enjoyed it. And I was like, yeah, I'll have some more of this. Mm -hmm. um, and it motivated me to, to pick up those extra instruments. Anyway, I didn't really like get into composition when I was until I was like 16 or 17 when I was part of the school jazz band and I had a knack for it apparently and my teacher was like, "Well, maybe you should apply to music school." And I was like, "Well, why not? I got nothing to lose apart from the application fee, of course." Um, and then I got into music school and I was like, "Well, I guess I'm good enough to do this even though I had no idea what I was doing." Um, just to give you just to give you an example, I turn up at the auditions, my portfolio is just full of piano piano works right. um now most portfolio you have to submit a portfolio of work showcasing your best compositions it should be a range of orchestra it should be it should have some small scale mm -hmm. stuff and it should maybe have some electronic stuff no nope, mine was just piano that's <laughs> it uh and i was like i really don't have a shot well obviously the opposite happened and uh so i so i asked my professor like why why did you accept me and he was like well Yep, you clearly don't know anything about orchestra, and you don't you don't really know much about arranging. <laughs> but there's one thing you you there's one thing you can do uh, that not many of the other applicants uh, showed in their portfolios, and it's that you can write a melody. Oh. Um, and that for that reason alone is basically why we accepted you and we liked you at the interview. Oh, um, very so, cool. So, um, I mean, his point being is that. All of the other stuff is fixable, mm -hmm. but the the melody writing it's the it's the hardest thing to teach because he said you have to have a feel for right. it. Um, and fortunately, that's kind of like helped me, especially at the beginning of my career. And has, uh, um, but it's kind of been the thing that I've been strongest at throughout. And yeah, like you said, you you can fix the other things. And you know, I'll never be done with learning orchestration because it's a, a lifetime study. So um, I didn't I didn't feel too bad about that. Um, then. Jumping ahead a little bit, um, getting into games specifically, uh, the early years of my career were kind of spent in the in the wilderness. I would say, um, you know, like for most artists, the early years are a struggle, and you just have to survive <laughs> right. as long as possible until you know enough people that can actually get you work. Because uh, frankly, it doesn't matter how talented you are if you don't if you don't want 
do the work and to meet people, you, you're, you're going to struggle. Um, so when I was a student, I joined a website called ModDB, which is a yeah. place where lots of game developers build, uh, build mods. And I actually drew a flow chart the other day and I can trace back every single job I've ever gotten to mod DB in games. Oh, wow. Including Ori. So, um, I'll do the Ori one first cause that's the really short, that's the really short story. Uh, the shorter flow chart. Um, so literally, uh, I'd done music for one mod and Thomas Marler, the director of Ori just randomly sent me an email one day cause he liked what was on my profile on the website. And he said, would you like to do the music for this prototype game I'm working on? And I was like, well, sure, send it over. I'll take a look at it. Um, now, I'm a gamer. I've been playing games since I was mm -hmm. four. And I think I have reasonably good taste. But hey, it's, all of that is a little bit subjective right. as well. But I, I, I picked up the game and I was like, OK, this game is different. It's already visually stunning. And it didn't even look like what it does mm -hmm. today. Um, and it just feels good to play. Um, so I asked Thomas, what's the deal? And he was like, well, if you do the prototype that we're pitching to publishers for free, uh, you can score the game. And I was like, OK, well, that seems like a good deal. Um, it was it was about 10 minutes of music. So mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really have any better prospects at the time. So I was like, OK, well, uh, I'll do it. Uh, and then five months later, they signed with Microsoft and the rest is history. Um, so that's like, you know, just just totally random email out of the blue one day. And it's amazing how often that happens. Um, but you know when it doesn't happen is when you don't have your work out there and you don't have a body of work right. to show. So you've, got, you've just got to do the work at the beginning and have confidence to put it out there. Um, then the other the other long flow chart um, so I worked on a game called Primal Carnage mm -hmm. in 2011. I signed up actually for that when I was a student. Now, as an offshoot of that game, I worked on In Momentum, which is a free running parkour game. And the reason I worked on that is because a programmer from Primal Carnage went off and made his own oh, game gotcha. and he went, needed a composer. And oh, this, oh, this get, no, this gets really good. So it's uh, <laughs> the, the flow chart is, is insane. So Primal Carnage comes out in 2012. Um, then there's, uh, you know, a little bit of a gap and I start working on Ori, but, uh, in 2014, the director of Primal Carnage makes his next game, which is called the Mean Greens, uh, a fun multiplayer shooter, which actually did quite well on steam. Um, so that was the next game. Um, then one of the sound designers who, uh, worked on Primal Carnage and Mean Greens, he leaves and he goes and works for a developer called Insomniac Games. And... I get I get a Skype message out of the blue one day. Hey, we've got this new game coming up. Um, would you like to pitch for it? And the music for The Unspoken, which is what I ended up doing for Insomniac mm -hmm. Games, is completely electronic. It's like the opposite of what it I've is, done for yeah. Ori. Um, and uh, I was like, okay, well, I'll pitch for it. Um, I have no idea why you want me to pitch for it, but uh, let's 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 do this. Um, and uh, I guess they did a blind test or something because I was the one that got it. But the, I mean, the thing they said to me was like, your your music has personality and it fits the game. So who am I to who am I to contest that? Um, and then the final one. <laughs> so the um, the team making Mean Greens and Primal Carnage actually. They also do some contracting work. A lot of independent studios do contracting work on the side. Well, one of their contracts was doing all of the creatures for Ark Survival mm -hmm. Evolved. And then the team doing Ark said, hey, do you know a composer? We really need one. And they, they put my name forward. I wrote them a main theme. Uh, the main theme is... I, I don't think I'm overstepping my mark in saying that it's quite loved by the players who mm -hmm. play the game. And uh, that was basically my pitch piece. And uh, well, I got the rest of the gig uh, from that. Now, the rest of the gig includes going to Abbey Road and recording with a 93-piece orchestra. So to get back to the beginning of that flowchart, me doing a couple of mods and putting a profile on what is a pretty niche right. part of the internet led to five games and a mass and the biggest orchestral recording of my career. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and so that's like a mini career advice thing as well. For people, because yeah. you, you, you just got basically my entire gaming history and uh, and where it all came from. Yeah, I mean, and the body of work, like you said, if you don't have it, uh, it's every everybody I talk to says the same thing. Like, you know, if you have one good piece that can work, but most of the time you need, you know, a lot of little small bits that people can sort of identify yep. with. 
and move move from there. When you were a kid and you were playing these games, was there ever a title you were playing and you were like, man, I love the music in this game? So the first time I really noticed it was in the um, the really early Star Wars games, Star Wars X-Wing mm-hmm. and Star Wars TIE Fighter, the, the simulator games. Um, now, they all had like a, a MIDI soundtrack, but what was unique about them is that they were one of the first games to change music on the fly. Mm-hmm. Uh it's it's an absolute genius system. They've basically transcribed all of John Williams' music into into a format that plays back on any terrible sound card from that era. Yeah. Uh, and they make it recognizable musically. But it also ties in with the events of the game. And what I think you have to remember is, is that those games shipped on five floppy disks right. originally. <laughs> like, how do you fit, like, I think it's about 60 missions in the first X-Wing game. How do you fit that and like the graphics and all of the mechanics of the game onto five floppy disks? It's 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 a, it's a 10 megabyte game. And now we're in the age where our in-game installs are 100 gigabytes. Yeah, yeah. 10 megabytes <laughs> isn't even a patch. 10 megabytes is a test no. for your internet speed, right? Like that's that's yeah, the button you exactly. press to test your internet speed. Um yeah, it, it's funny because a, a lot of the composers I talk to, uh, you know, asking them like what what games what games that they liked when they were younger, a lot of times in some way it always seems to connect to what they like the most, whether it be composing or whether it be a particular yeah. instrument. And it's funny since you were sort of, you, you know, what you liked and then suddenly you get this thing, which when you look at the way those games were created and the hooks that they used, it is yeah. composing digitally, you know, with a computer, like the computer yeah. testing, seeing what you're doing as a player and then going, yep. okay. And uh, one question um, that I ask a lot of people who work on games, especially composers like yourself, do you ever have you ever felt stymied by th- that feeling that a hook could change what you wanted in a song, or are you are you just hands off? Are you like, okay, if it's dynamic music, they're going to hear this in a way that they want. It's not going to be like how I envision the entire track. Because for example, Austin and I talked for a long time about OSTs. You know, is the OST what you wanted or is it what the game played as what you wanted? So, like, do you ever feel different about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think it really depends on on the game. I, I've talked about this at length um, and I, I don't mind saying this anymore because it's a little bit controversial. But I think I think interactive and dynamic music is a little bit overrated mm-hmm. um, as, a, as a concept, because ultimately you can have the greatest music in the world ever. Um, but it can it can be it can sometimes be let down by a dynamic system because you are ultimately relying on a computer to construct emotion. And I don't believe it's possible. Right. Um, it has it hasn't been proven to me yet. Um, conversely, you can have the greatest, most dynamic, most intelligent, most interactive music system ever. But if your music isn't good, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, right. Um, now. I think the ideal scenario is to have a combination between between the two. Um, see, what we did on Ori, partially for resource reasons, because it's a really it's it is a pretty low budget game. I know everyone likes to say, well, it's not really an indie game because it's published by Microsoft. Well, yeah, but no, it's it, if you saw the size of the team and the size of the budgets, you you it's it's an indie game. Um, so we didn't really we didn't have a music system. The only music system that we had was what I asked the programmers to code up for mm, me, gotcha. which is kind of nice because it's it's custom. But the only place where the music is being scripted is in the prologue, and really that's just to time all the transitions to make sure they're absolutely perfect because it's extremely linear. But the rest of the game, it's just stereo loops playing back and over and over and over again. And I was a little bit concerned about that because, you know, we have the whole what happens if the player stays in the same area and they start hearing the same melody. But I looked and I looked and I looked and it didn't come up. Um, So I think there is something to be said for making sure you have the right music that feels good in each scene. I think game scoring, it's, it's less about scoring the again it depends on the game so i don't want to make huge generalizations but it's less in the case of ori it's less about scoring the moment to moment gameplay and what does the player feel over the long term because you know if you sit down to play a game you're committing to sitting there probably for two hours unless you rage quit on the water escape sequence i was actually gonna Um, say if there was any (laughs) sequence that did have repeating loops that would be the one everybody noticed yeah when we reviewed that it was just like oh my god this one scene holy crap (laughs) 
But I'll, t- I'll tell you, I can tell you the reason for that because um, when when I first wrote that, I did the whole yeah, let's have some layered action music and it will increase in, te- in intensity as you get further up the top. We did all that, and it I didn't feel anything right. when I when I when I played it. I was like, okay, well, this is just another action scene, and I'm like, well, what is going to push this over the top? And it's going to be a risk. But I'm like, well, what if we just put the main theme on top? Mm-hmm. Now, what and and that's obviously what happened because it ended up in the final game. Now, the reasoning for that is not because it's not actually because oh well, make it giving it a melody makes it more interesting. It's actually because it's the theme that you've heard from the beginning of the game. It's really the first point in the game where Ori actually makes a significant difference, and you want the player to feel like they're they're actually you know doing something heroic. Right. And with just the generic action music, all the player knows is that, like, I'm in danger. I've got to get out. Whereas if you put Ori's theme on top, at least this is my this is my approach to it. If you put Ori's theme on top, it's like, oh, my God, I've got to get out of here because I've got to save Ori. And Ori's doing something different. Uh, oh, it's so triumphant. And I died again. Yeah. Um, but then it starts up again. I think, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm sure it annoyed some players, but I think it's a combo of being annoyed that they couldn't finish it. I think it's, I don't think it's the music that stopped them from, I know. from finishing it. It's I, just, you're going to notice it if you're doing it for the hundredth time. I get exactly. it. Exactly. I don't, I don't know of anybody who mentioned, that's why I mentioned that part because, uh, I don't know of anybody who said, oh, the music looped it. Uh, in fact, <laughs> I did it so many times. I also like the duality of doing the main theme inside of the game at some point. Um, I know some composers have interlaced little bits of it in at different points, but I like that idea because like you said, it's sort of the first time that Ori, I, I, something about it just sort of connected right at that point. It was like, okay, this is a big deal. And it yeah. connects you sort of, you, it connects your memory from all the way at the starting and you sort of see this journey and the journey can yep. be told either visually or, or via audio. And I think right there, that's a perfect example of where it doesn't need to be dynamic. It can just be, you know, yeah. And I think it would have been fine without it, but fine isn't what we were looking right. for, especially at that moment, because it is probably the most famous moment from the game, especially because it's not really it's not really just the uh, the water chase. You know, getting up that Ginzo tree is quite oh, difficult, man. especially because you've been just been introduced to Bash. Um, I personally, and I, I said this at the time, I personally would have liked to sp- have spent a little bit longer teaching the player Bash, mm-hmm. um, but uh, it was too late in the game to change it. So, uh, um, but it's yeah, you get up the tree, then you you know you think you've healed everything. Okay, now I have to get out of here. Then you have a really epic cutscene on top, right. and then it all transitions into into waking up in the what was originally the the corrupted swamp and now it's clean because the clean the clean waters there sorry spoilers everyone but i figured most people would have played yeah, it by now yeah. two two years on um and th- again this is my like all of those cues that play there they're they're all just stereo but it feels dynamic because it is changing like in the in the big moments like you, know, you get to the top of the tree the cue changes uh you you f- you wake up at the bottom of the swamp the queue changes but it's more of a big picture thing rather than like you know doing something for every time ori is heard or right. like you know changing the intensity when the water gets even more intense like how do you differentiate between water being intense and then it being super intense more intense <laughs> right yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know so so when i'm when i'm scoring a game like in a narrative sense um all i'm trying to do is find a solution to figure out how to make all the scenes connect in a way that feels good i think i think the mistake that several developers make and not all of them but um i've I've experienced this firsthand you get you get the scope of the game and then you get the spreadsheet with the list of cues Mm -hmm. and it's like level one level two level three and you can end up scoring those in isolation but you you might never see how they're all connected and it's it's the connection between level one two and three that i think takes and it's not just visually it's sorry it's not just musically it's visually and it's in terms of gameplay and design it's the connection between all of the levels that takes a game from being good to a game being great right. uh, that's and, and again this is only for narrative games for like a car racing game interactive music makes so much sense it's not even funny like it's uh and and heck even for the uh for the unspoken which is a fighting game the game has four clear musical states and it has four clear game states which all require different music and that needs to change on the fly so then in, in those games where the action is a little bit more controlled mm-hmm. uh, i think it makes total sense but i think for the open world stuff 
a much bigger game than Ori, The Witcher 3. I, I spoke to the composer, and I believe he said that he was like, yeah, we just used stereo loops yeah. because that's what felt good. You know? So if The Witcher 3 is doing it, yeah. <laughs> it's it's probably okay. And that game is pretty good, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's it's considered okay, <laughs> at least, right? It's probably a 6 on Metacritic. Um, So... One of the things that does pop up, and you spoke just briefly about it, is sometimes when you, when you're writing something and and trying to feel exactly how it's supposed to go together versus maybe how it will in the game. Do you ever, yeah. if there's ever a time where you don't have inspiration, and I want to talk about creating from the start right. in a bit, but if you're in the midst of something and you're you're looking at this tree as an example for Ori, and you're like, I'm not getting it. Do you go out for a drive? Do you like, what do you do to get that? If you're like, okay, this is not working for me. What do you do for inspiration in those mind blocked moments? In the mind block moments, I do anything that isn't sitting in front of my computer, <laughs> right. like literally, literally anything that takes me out of this, this place, because I think, um, I, I've, I've said this a lot recently to, uh, to comp I spoke to a bunch of composers recently. And I was like, Look, if you try to fight it, you're just going to make yourself feel worse. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, not, uh, unfortunately, for writer's block, there is not an approach that will like, help everyone. But uh, I, I, I would, I think it's a safe bet that if you try and fight it, it doesn't really make, it make it happen. The only, the only exception where fighting works if you have take to fall back on uh and that's where education can, can, can help you out like all i'm just doing for ideas out of text can so i can we don't want to look at a textbook that's the thing um so uh, do you still have my internet? yeah yeah your your connection comp uh it, don't worry i've noted it already you're can it, it's it's coming back it's just skype yeah, it's it's um yeah I got I got the red box yeah. uh, red box of doom. We'll give it a second. I mean Microsoft owns Skype as well, so it's like yeah. <laughs> we, well we can't talk bad about them because they did publish one of your games. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> just joking. <laughs> uh, we'll just give it a second. Um, and I can um, I think most of the audio actually came through for that anyway. But actually, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna call you back and yep. see if we can get a new hookup here. Huh? And that's pretty much perfect. And the recover and the recovery is complete. Yes, indeed. So, um, it, it, regardless if if that question gets in there or not, I'll go back and look. Yeah. Um, when it comes to that, you know, talking to uh, I do get a chance to talk to a lot of composers, a lot of different people who are either trying to get into the game or have been in for a while, and they always talk about inspiration being, you know, anything except for in front of the keyboard, like you said. It is. I also find it funny that. Uh, one of them who I, the, his video will come up here soon, as well as uh, the the composer for Dead Rising Four, they change yep. around their writing location many times. So they will actually like change the visuals, whether it be posters or color on a wall. One of one of the composers I know has a massive, basically I'd just call it like a pastel different colored wall, and he can flip it. And he can put different colors, and he's like, you would be surprised. There's a reason why a lot of writers will say they do their best writing in the bathroom. Because sometimes it's just a white screen. It's a change of location. Yeah, yeah I think, I, I mean, and one of the things we we are forced to confront as composers is the whole cabin fever thing. You know, right. a lot of the time you're right. at home by yourself, and uh, you don't, if you don't have anyone to talk to, I mean, that's one of the, that is one of the tough things, because you can be, you can be shut off. I mean, sometimes... Uh, sometimes you just need to call someone and just like have a chat about the state of the world or how terrible your job is or how great your job is. Um, but um, also, I think one of the things that helps me, I don't experience writer's block as, as uh, <laughs> touch wood as, uh, as much as I know some other people do. Um, but I think one of the key things is, is just getting out and experiencing real mm -hmm. life. I was extremely fortunate um, that I had a family that loved to travel. Um, so I've been going on vacation since I was four. I mean, the, the list of countries I've been to is ridiculous. But also at boarding school, there'd be school trips and not just school trips around England. There'd be school trips, you know, a ski trip to France, a ski trip right. to uh, France, Germany, Switzerland, Italy. Um, our sports teams would go on on tour like around the world to play, you know, to play rugby in South Africa, you know, so uh, hockey in Kenya, like all, not ice hockey, by the way, field hockey, <laughs> ice hockey in Kenya would be a bit of a stretch. Um, <laughs> Didn't but, somebody have uh, a bobsledding team? I think there was a TV. I think uh, there was a movie. Jamaica, Jamaicans. Yeah. Jamaica. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
um, after I did my, after I finished my undergrad, I was like, well, I'm not ready to compose, uh, for a career. I went and taught English in Japan for three years, oh. which gave me access to the whole of Asia. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it's much easier to travel to Asia, a, a, anywhere in Asia when you live in Japan, as opposed to getting a $1,000 flight from England to China, England to Hong Kong, England to wherever. Um, when your base is Japan, it's much easier to get anywhere in Asia. So I took advantage of that. Um, you know, since I moved to the States, uh, I've seen a lot of the States because I think this country is pretty amazing and pretty, pretty beautiful. There's a lot going on yeah. here. Um, and I think uh, just getting out and experiencing the world and experiencing other people as well. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good listener because I like to hear other people's stories and then use them as inspiration in my own yeah, work. Sure. Um, and, and it's not just the good stories. I mean, you need, you need the crappy stories as well to give you perspective. Yeah. Um, and that comes from your own real life experiences as well. You know, we're all going to experience death in some way uh, through our family members and we're all going to experience happiness, you know, through various life events. Um, and I think the more of that you can pack in to your brain, especially early on, the more perspective you're going to have to draw on and inspiration when you are struggling. Yeah. I'm um, sorry, that's like a slightly serious answer, but uh, that's that's generally been like my approach is to draw on the experiences that I've had in the past. Um, and if that fails, well, I'll just go and play some video games or watch a film. <laughs> yeah, and right. Honestly, honestly, that can solve it. Um, I, I tend to find that like when I need to write happy music, I need to be pissed off. Oh, gotcha. Uh, and and vice versa for the other way around. Like uh, I wrote the the sacrifice, which is the final cue of 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 Ori that plays before the end credits. When I was incredibly in, in an incredibly good mood, um, and it's a pretty sad piece of music. It's just it's just the way I'm I'm wired. I mm -hmm. think so. You know, if I'm uh, if I'm uh, if I'm needing to write happy music, I'll I'll go and play I'll go and play an hour of Dead Space or something. And just get myself. <laughs> That's, it doesn't really make me sad, but it just like puts me in the dark right. place um, that that I need to be. Yeah. Um, no, that's perfect. That's a so. cool. That's a cool little dichotomy. Uh, the especially with Jesse and then the composer for Dead Rising, we were discussing different psychology for like the person who creates it and how much it can matter. Yep. You know, it's not only the game, but it's also the headspace of the composer when. When I was talking to them, I always I always ask because I'm fascinated about how people create these days. And so uh, it was funny because Austin's like, I have this piece of paper everywhere and I'll just write stuff while driving. Like I'll be driving and I'll just start writing some some music down. Do you ever find yourself doing that or are you more of a I sit down to do it kind of person? Are you more analog, digital, like piece of paper and pen or are you like I need to, the computer? So I, I switch off completely when I'm not in this room. Mm -hmm. Like this room is the only place where music happens. Um, so, uh, cause I feel like when I'm entering here, I'm going to work and sure. when I'm out of here, I'm not at work. Um, I think if I'm working, uh, don't get me wrong. Some people can work everywhere and that totally, totally works for right. them. But like, it's, it's definitely not for me. Um, I, I, I've discovered recently that in terms of the number of hours I put mm -hmm. in, I don't put that many in to actually composing. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think composing uses a different side of the brain to the technical side of my work, right. which is mixing, choosing sounds, producing, like getting it to sound good. Um, the actual number of hours per day spent composing, it's pretty low. Like if I, if, if it's more than four, uh, I consider that a good day. Um, but I will say this, I'm very, very efficient with my time. Um, partially cause I value the other things that I right. do outside of this right. room. Um, yeah. The only time when I, you know, when I sit in here for like really long periods of time is when it's crunch time and, and just like we've got to get like a million things done. Um, in terms of my process, I would like to use more analog gear like a real piano, but I do not have room for it currently right. um, because I am, as I alluded to at the very beginning, I'm pretty good at piano. Like I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, most composers will use a piano anyway, but I like my piano skills go way beyond the, the like the basic composery level that you need to be at. Um, because I'm, I'm playing on a digital keyboard because it's connected to the computer, which is how I write. Um, I am, I am, 
99% convinced that as soon as I switch to a real piano, the level of my compositional writing will go up sure. because there is something magical about all the resonances that happen when you're playing a real yeah. piano uh, that don't happen no matter how you can have the greatest piano virtual instrument of all time. It's just not the same because you need to you need to feel the keys, vibration, press, everything, vibrations, yeah. all of that. Um, but it's it's not it's not quite doable yet not in this not in this room but wherever wherever we move to next it will probably be happening and it doesn't even need to be a grand piano it can be like an upright it's just it's just it's it's funny you mentioned psychology because that is a psychological thing for me even entering this room um like originally before i moved into this house uh my my studio was in my bedroom because los angeles is very expensive right. um and i just you know and and that was a that was a mind block for me for quite a long mm -hmm. time. And just having a separate room to write in that is separate from where I sleep and where I watch TV and all of that, uh, I became like ten times more efficient gotcha. just from doing that. And so, like the next thing for me will be switching to to you know having a piano and a, like a little sketchbook. That said, I do use pencil and paper to write down melodic ideas because it all starts for the melody for me, unless the score doesn't require it, which does happen from time mm -hmm. to time. Um, but yeah. Most of the time I'm writing into the computer because my my music or he's considered an orchestral score, but there's a whole layer of other stuff that right. is going on behind the string section that kind of makes it what it is. Um, the orchestra is a significant color, but it, at the end of the day, to me, the way I perceive it, it is just another color that goes with all of the bells, all of the pads, all of this. There are a lot of synthetic sounds. For a game that's set in a forest, there are actually a lot of yeah. synthetic yeah, sounds. Yeah, there is. Um, and but it's subtle. It's not like it's not like uh, you know we're switching to dubstep <laughs> for the water rising cue. Um, Sometimes I sometimes I uh, I like to troll the team because I have access to the entire game build mm -hmm. and so I can switch out the files at any time and so sometimes overnight I'll just change the music to something completely Throw in some ridiculous. house of pain. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, because you know it's really easy to switch right. it back, but like sometimes they, it's uh, it's just a nice little way to have a bit of fun with the team. Um, uh, when it when it comes to you know the creation, I I, I want to talk in particular about the differences between Ori and, and maybe Unspoken or something like that, but um. I, I watched your behind the scenes for Unspoken. You were saying two to three weeks of, you know, sort of messing around with your with with your ideas until you sort of get a paint. I think yep. you described it the same way. The same way Jesse did, I think, which was like a paint set. But one yep. of my questions is even prior to that, um, do you sort of to use the same analogy, do you sort of already have an idea that it'll be oil paints versus watercolors or are you totally just like I have? I don't know if it's going to be any kind of instrument set or anything, I am absolutely open. Or when somebody tells you a game, do you already find yourself focusing on something? One one thing that helped a little bit with Insomniac uh, was that they, they were quite explicit about wanting an electronically driven score. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, well, okay, there's, there's electronically driven, but if we just do that, it's probably it's probably going to lack a little bit of interest. So this is the idea, and you've watched you've watched the behind the scenes video, so you know this. Uh, the game had on launch had had three characters, and I decided to assign a real instrument to each main okay. character, um, just to like give something just to give each character a level of personality that might not come through as easily with the electronic only approach mm -hmm. um and also instead of just using electronic drums only we also use live recorded drums oh. uh, with a really good rock drummer um and that and that just made the tracks groove a little bit better mm -hmm. um, and just feel a little better rather than being because it's a game about magic. So there's mysticism and a little bit of the ethereal thing going on. And you don't want the music to be super rigid. Um, that said, they have just released a new character into the game called the Electromancer. So, and so obviously all acoustic sounds removed right. for that because it's called the Electromancer. Right. I mean, that's that's so I, what I'm looking for. And that that's actually a good example is like I'm looking for any hints dropped by the developer mm -hmm. as to like what might be needed. Um, you know, the Electromancer told me. Well, let's do the most obvious thing. Let's uh, let's remove all acoustic instruments. Now I'll jump to Ori, and for example, in the Valley of the Wind. Well, what what kind of instrument do you think would should be the main yeah, focus exactly. for Valley of the Wind? Exactly. Like, 
I know it seems really obvious, but sometimes the most obvious solution is is quite often the right one. And for Valley of the Wind, I didn't just use a flute. We used an Indian flute called a Bansuri, mm -hmm. which is a unique, uh, a slightly... I mean, it's not a unique instrument. It's basically just a wooden flute with some holes in it. But like, um, it has a breathier quality. Mm -hmm. um, and with the with the player who played on that, Rachel Mellis, I I had her play several short phrases um, that we would repeat throughout the track. that are kind of really in the background, but a, a lot of Ori sound is made up of little little pulses because you're always moving in the game. Right. So there's got to be there's always got to be movement in the music. And if you listen carefully, there is always some kind of pulse going on. It's not always obvious. Most people when they think of pulses, they think of like some electronic thing going on in the background. But this could be just like a constant like plucked guitar rhythm. Uh, in spirit caverns, it's actually like a, a bell sound that's being reversed. So, so what happens is you hear the transient of a bell being mm -hmm. hit, like ding, 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 ding. But if you play that in reverse, you don't really hear the hard strike of the ding, but you hear kind of like a sucking mm -hmm. sound that creates a, creates a rhythm by itself. Um, so in the spirit caverns, I believe it's uh, the track is like track eight or nine. It's called Up the Spirit Caverns Walls. You can hear like this metallic -y bell like sound that's playing in reverse the whole way through. Um, that's another example of a pulse. Um, so what I did with Rachel on Valley of the Wind, um, we recorded several different phrases and I used them as building blocks to construct the track. Then on top of that, I'd have her play melodies. Gotcha. So you've not only got the wind providing the engine for the track, but we've also got it providing the melody and um, those two tracks, Riding the Wind and Completing the Circle, uh, they're my two favorite tracks on the on the Ori album, at least for the the gameplay stuff. Um, and I think they're actually the last two that I wrote, actually. Oh. So I guess I was I guess I was kind of in the zone. Right. Uh, the last track that actually got completed. Um, here's another little anecdotal story. Um, the last track that got completed for the game was the second chase sequence. Oh. Now, when I went to when I went to record in Nashville, we we recorded in October 2014, which is uh, five months before the game shipped. Well, the uh, the second chase sequence wasn't didn't exist. <laughs> so we were running a little bit. People behind. just telling you I what mean, to write for, basically. I mean, it kind of did exist, but it was unplayable, uh -huh. um, and it just it just it just didn't really work. And I was like, "Well, this is the wind escape theme." So, so basically, I couldn't record anything in Nashville. I just I just like I'll, I'm going to figure it out later, um, which is a little bit risky, but I didn't have anything to go on. And this is going to sound a little cheap, but it's what we did, and it totally worked. So. When it came to like deciding what to do for the music for the the second escape scene, I'm like, well, I don't really have anything except the 120 minutes of music that I've already recorded. So let's dive into that. And I was like, well, what if I took the water chase music, pitched the entire mix up just one step, mm -hmm. and added some wind over it? And that's what's in the game. Hey, whatever works and, and, and is one of I your mean, favorites. It's it feels it feels it feels different enough. Mm -hmm. So um I, I think uh you know it was it was definitely a a, a, a band-aid solution. But I go onto YouTube and look at the comments for the track. Yeah, I love how different this is, and I'm like, oh man, if only you knew. And I'm kind of giving away the secret now because it's two years after the game, so uh, I don't feel so bad. But yeah, it literally was that track was constructed by me going into my my music software bringing in the track and it's literally three clicks later i pr process transpose one step and then it's up one step add a flute on top yeah it took about 10 minutes and here's the thing we we i i see this i see that kind of comment a lot of times even with stuff i do where somebody's like oh this is different blah 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 and i'm like actually it's it's not but what i've learned over time is that many times people hook on the difference yep. and the difference is there that's what they hear but they don't realize that the only way they know there's a difference is because they heard this before and so yep. there's that connection but for a lot of people it's difficult to describe so they're just like oh this is this is but they don't really realize that maybe when they heard the first part of it their brain was like oh if this was higher and then you go and you do that and they're like oh it works 
all, all you notice is, is that you feel if you feel it's different you don't quite know right. why but it doesn't matter because you're playing the game and hey i've got to get out yeah. of here like uh so in that sense it, may, it actually helped uh unify the chase sequences the the, the only thing the only time when we change up the chase sequence music is is at the end but that's because you've got kuro chasing mm -hmm. you so it's a little bit cool. different as opposed to the environment chasing you um but it's it's funny it's funny like you what you mentioned kind of goes back to what i was talking about doing like uh you know not scoring moment to moment mm -hmm. gameplay but thinking about the big picture um one of one of my favorite composers uh working games is jesper kid yeah. because i feel like i feel like he even if he doesn't have a similar approach it feels like he has a similar approach because he I think when he writes, and I've played most of Jesper games that Jesper's worked on, because uh, I'm a big fan, and it feels like he's not scoring moment to moment. He is trying to get into the head of what the player should be feeling, and I think that's the key for games. And it can, um, that's that's something I th think I have in sync with Jesper and um, and and other composers. That's that's always what I'm trying to do is uh, get into the head of the player. Um, and and sometimes you know, th th there is an argument to be made like should you be spoon feeding the emotion to the player right. or should you? And I'm like, well. It, again, it depends on the game, but like let's let's take ET for an example. When the flying when the flying moment starts, mm. you're you're ready to, you're ready to cry. Yeah. You're like come yeah. on, come on, Steven Spielberg, like throw it at me. Like I'm ready. Like give, give me, me the moment. Paxel moment, then, baby. I need my yes, Paxel. <laughs> exactly. Like that's that's kind of what you've been waiting for. And I, I think it's okay to handhold the audience through scenes sometimes. Right. Obviously, you don't want to do it for the whole game. Like this, most of Ori's gameplay music takes kind of a step back. It's it not, does. It's not really in your face. Uh, but when we do step it up, we really step it up. And and I would say it's you know sometimes it's on the nose, but I think that's okay. Um, other times, uh, but other times you you might want to just take a step back completely. Um, another another anecdote. Um, I don't know if you remember the game, but there's like a stealth sequence just after the... I do the, remember the you, game. I just played it. Um, right. Okay, great. Um, so um, you're kind of like playing... We, we actually call the sequence hide and seek. Hide and seek. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause that, that's what you're doing with Kuro. Now, our director, he wanted to do like typical upbeat boss gameplay music. <laughs> right. Well, the, the big antagonist is on screen. And we tried it, and it was and it was terrible. Um, and I was like, okay, this is one time where music needs to like basically just be sound design. Uh, the 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 line between music and sound design needs to be really really close here. Um, and it ended up being like a really cool stealth sequence, at least in in my opinion, in in, in a platformer. Like it, di I I didn't think that scene was going to work as well as it did, but because also because it came after one of the escape sequences, it was a really like nice contrast um, to the, the 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 platforming, the the tense platforming that had come before. Uh, in in this in in this section, it's still tense, but you've got to move slowly and deliberately rather than just like ah, get me out of here. Um, this is like I got to get out of here but i got to think and about i think it. that those are uh we i've talked about it before like palette cleanser kind of moments that can happen in a game where you, you know if you're playing one particular element especially in that where it's a little later in the game uh a lot of games let's be honest they become a it's cyclic it's like the same thing it's like okay there'll be these three levels then these three but if you have a game where suddenly there's something different like a stealth level in that you it, it makes your brain go Oh man, am I only a quarter of the way through the game? Because most games don't do, and and so you you have that dichotomy there. I like the fact I've, that uh, you guys chose to do that with the music and the sound, and just say let's sort of make it match up instead of the big boss music, because I don't think that would have worked. Uh, no, I agree, and and it's and it's it, we did we did try it out. I think we actually did a talk at GDC where you can actually see online what it looks oh, like. Okay. Um, cause they, they just published the talk recently and, um, I made a little video of, uh, what that scene would look like with boss music. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. It's, uh, but, but Thomas, the director is like, well, if you don't think it works, well, show me something better. That's always the solution. He's like, he'll, he'll give you the direction and that's the direction until you prove that there's another solution that exists. He's he, uh, the mantra at moon studios is show don't tell, you know? Uh, cause, cause initially when Thomas said like do initial boss music, I'm like, that's a terrible idea. Why would we do that? It's like, well, you haven't proven that it's a terrible idea. So go prove it. Um, which is a really refreshing approach yeah. as far as I'm concerned.
Like, you know, it's it's quite blunt, but at the same time, it's like, well, fair enough. I'll, okay, I'll go and prove it. Damn it, I'm going to prove that you're. I'm going to prove that the director's wrong. Right. Um, but you know, once once it's proven, uh, you know, he's like, okay, I agree. That's it. This is uh, this is a much better 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 scene uh, with this music. So, um, there's a lot of give and take in Moon, not just between music and the director. It's it's all departments kind of like work with each other. There is a unique synergy between the departments that uh, I think you can only really do in an in an indie game because once because once once get once the, the the numbers start getting too big it can be difficult to to coordinate a unified vision um, um so in one particular uh, before we move on because i want to talk about unspoken and and art sorry, yeah. but um <laughs> no it's don't don't worry i've I, i've i've had four hour uh, interviews before i'm okay. i'm totally good but what i wanted to do was cover one particular part of the soundtrack of ori and it's uh it's 32 i think light of Nib nibel yep. is it am i pronounced yep. nibel Nibel. So yep. that's got so the vocals that are in there. Um, yeah. How do you decide? Uh, uh, this comes up a lot. You, I mean, I, I was going to say you'd be surprised, but you probably wouldn't. But people I'm talking to, many times they'll say, well, does the does the composer treat the vocal like an instrument? Like, how do they know how loud the vocal should be? Because if the vocal is very loud, it becomes a vocal track. Like, at, even, even right. if they're not saying words. And if it's so low, yep. you can't pick it up. How do you treat that? And did you feel it? Did it change when you were creating that particular track? Well, um, with the vocals, um, I'll, I'll just address the, the vocals in general before getting to Light, light of Nobel. So um, when I first started doing music for the game, I, I knew that I wanted a vocal sound, but I was struggling with finding the right singer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's... It's not just a case of going out and hiring a session singer, which would be very easy to do. Um, but w I kind of wanted to find someone who, for want of a better word, was desperate. Because like everyone was kind of desperate who was working at Moon Studios. Yeah. We really wanted to make it work. Like Thomas, he left a job at Blizzard. Like several people left jobs at their left nice jobs, left well-paying jobs to come and make this, you know, small indie mm -hmm. game, which could be good. But hey, there's no guarantee, right? right? Um, so I took the same approach with uh, with the vocal because I knew I knew it was going to be a uh, an important part of the score, um, and after many many hours, maybe days of searching online and through YouTube, I eventually came across Erily Brighton, and uh, um, I messaged her, and then found out that she lived ten minutes away from my house. So <laughs> that's always uh, that's always helpful too. So <laughs> Um, so we got together and we recorded some stuff. Uh, we recorded the trailer music first. That was, and I was like, okay, that's the trailer music was the first thing. I was like, okay, this is where we can use the vocal as like a, a kind of pivot point for significant, significant moments in the game. Now, if you've, you've played the game and anyone who has played the game, we actually only use the vocals during cutscenes mm -hmm. and story moments. Because we tried putting vocals in the gameplay and to come back to your point, when it becomes a vocal piece, it's distracting. Yeah. Um, it it's like because because you kind of want to stop and listen to it, but also, you know, why would you stop and listen to it when like three especially things especially like, in that game? Yeah, you. exactly. Right. Um, so you know, I uh, the water chase sequence. I experimented with putting vocals mm. there. Just it's too much. Like that, you're already putting the melody on top was like was kind of like a, a risky move. But putting the vocal on top, it would have been it would have been overpowering. So. And I think this worked out well. We chose to use it only for the for the cutscenes because then you can actually dial mm -hmm. it up a little bit, and it's okay. Now to get back to Light of Nibel, it's that is the piece that plays during the end of the end credits, and the end credits for me are a big part of the game. I think a lot of people, you know, because you've you've just gone come through this epic journey, you kind of need a bit of time, especially in this game with the intensity of the ending, you kind of need a bit of time to decompress. Right. Uh, I've always felt that end credits music is part of the film or part of the game. And I think, I think it's like, an, especially if you've seen something with a deep narrative, you, you need time to, you know, to process it. Um, and with the vocals, the vocals kind of represent the, for want of a better word, the voice of the forest. It's like I'm healed and I'm released now. Um, whereas in the game, through up till then, other than the opening, they're kind of a little bit muted mm -hmm. um, and they're kind of like held back. This is kind of like the release point. I think. I think at the end of the track when it transitions, there's like five aerials right. singing on top of each other. Um, it's a it's a very deeply layered sound. Um, 
And that was definitely a deliberate choice. Like I, I wanted, I wanted the end credits to feel like a major tension mm-hmm. release. So that's why they're dialed up to the max there. Um, but ultimately, Light of Nabel is just a reworking of the Water Chase right. game with vocals thrown on top, but in a much more ethereal and slightly more epic way. Um, because it is, it is the final point of the game. It was tempting to end the the whole the whole score with a big bang and a big boom kind of like lion king and everything but uh the quiet ending seemed to be more appropriate yeah and i I think Uh, that allows you you said you know reflection and without getting too much into it for people who haven't played the game i i think that that makes perfect sense for that because sometimes you'll get a game not not to be rude but sometimes the the ending credit songs can be fairly terrible and I've all and I know a co- oh films too. There's nothing. Oh, there's nothing, nothing that annoys worse. me more. Than, let's let's put a pop song at the end. Right. No. Yeah. Why? Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is the worst defender. What's at that. the end of that? <laughs> Some Chinese. Pop oh, gotcha. Song. It's like and it's got like this cheesy like early '90s drum beat behind oh. it. It's it's basically it's canto pop. Like you've had this entire score recorded by an amazing orchestra. You've got these amazing taiko drummers playing for the whole score. It's a very like serious. Uh, um chinese orchestral score and it's like right let's because we need to sell <laughs> units of the soundtrack album let's get a really famous chinese artist and have her sing a pop yeah song. um a, a couple you know composers i've talked to said you know gave me some examples of a couple games where they weren't happy with their choice uh because the ending credits they were like oh you know what this is it's just sort of the expected you know da, 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 da. you know it's like we did it you know america fuck yeah and you're like okay i get it uh but i think with 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 a lot of titles where you give a, uh, the gamer that chance to sort of sit back, then they're making memories even as they're listening. And you, that's how the brain yep. works. You know, you're, it's just constantly like remembering little bits. And then once it all cycles back and you get back to your main theme, I do feel that there's something to me a little bit cerebral about the ending credit songs. And it sounds so stupid because a lot of people will get mad at me because I'll put ending credits in my reviews, but I'll, it won't, it won't be spoiler, but it'll be there. And there's an actual reason I do that a lot of times, because when I'm talking about music, if that ending credits is bad, I'll mention it in the review. I'll be like, okay, but you know, like this sounds just weird. You know, it's, it's not like it affects the review. It's just like, this is an odd choice. Um, but I want to jump to the unspoken for a second because so this is Go so this is so weird to me because <laughs> I, 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 I it is all digital it is all yep. just synthy and almost I swear to God wh- the first time I heard it and then listened to it and then sat and listened to it again and again I sw- there's a horror it, it almost feels like there's moments I don't know if it's just because it's such a change but there is actual <laughs> times where I'm like. If if you hadn't told me about this, I would think it was like a horror, like um, until dawn or something at different times. Did you do that on purpose? Does that darkness sort of in there, or am I just an idiot and there's no darkness in there at all? There there is a a kind of hidden darkness within the game. I mean, the visuals are uh, I, I think it's safe to say typical insomniac visuals, right. like what the kind of what they're known for. But I mean. Uh, if you've seen Edge of Nowhere, I mean that 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 is which they also they did. did. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you know, they are capable of doing dark right. as well. That's for sure. Um, and uh, this, like, they they emphasized at the beginning that like this is an underground like magic, you know, movement in 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 the game, and they 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 implied that there is something lurking beneath the surface. There is some additional content coming later this year Mm -hmm. um, that uh, Mike will go into detail behind the darkness of the game. But overall, it's kind of like it's got a slightly gothic feel, but it it also needs to feel it needs to feel modern because we are in the 21st century in the game. Basically, they did not want it to feel like Harry Potter Wizards. (laughs) Um, They they kind of wanted the opposite of that. I mean, the, the, the temp music that I did that I used as reference to pitch was, was from the judge dread score. Oh, okay. like, uh, and, and I think, I think actually the new one, not the, the re- one that was remade a couple of years ago, not the old one, which is like super heavy. Stallone, and very yeah, electronic. Right. Yeah. Um, so I was like, okay, well that's interesting for a magic game. Um, but I mean, one of the other reasons is if, if you've seen footage from the yeah. game, it gets pretty crazy and intense. You've got like giant serpents uh, in a trailer they released recently. A Ferris wheel turns into a spider. Right. Yeah, that I is mean, true. That's just yeah. bananas. Um, it's it's uh, so so it's 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 more like 
what if the world around you became incredibly dark right. like because that is that is kind of like an underlying thing th theme behind the game um because there is a lot of environment manipulation and in virtual reality like when that ferris wheel turns into the spider it it's very overwhelming in in the best way possible in the best way in the way that vr was designed presence, to be presence presence yeah, uh, yeah which cannot um, be done on a 2d screen so. no i mean it still feels it still looks kind of cool on a 2d screen yeah. but no once once it's like you're looking around and you're like looking directly at that ferris wheel that just turned into spider it's like okay this is this is awesome uh now what am i going to do because i'm terrified um one of the cool things about about vr i find is like because a lot of times you've got to do the actual movements mm -hmm. um your brain can't keep your, your sorry your body can't keep up with your brain see when you're when you're playing games like this thing <laughs> it speeds up so many movements right. for you like a kick in real life takes like you know it takes like about a right. second to pull right. off if, if I'm doing a kick, all I have to do is press A. That's glorious. Um, but no, in VR, like you've got to do a little bit more to mm -hmm. get a response from your characters. So um, it actually makes it more intense because you've, everything is sped up even more because it, everything around you is sped up because you've got to be slower and more deliberate in your movements to get them right. So there's more pressure on you to execute it. So anyway, getting back to the darkness because I'm really enthusiastic about no, VR that's, that's compared awesome. to compared to like what I used to. I used to be a VR skeptic, and then when it's done right, it's unbelievable. Yeah. But with it's still very very early. Um, I think VR overall is set to live a very good life in arcades. Um, rather than in living rooms because until someone creates a wireless vr set right. it's kind of kind of tricky to get it into living yeah. rooms but back to, yeah back to the the darkness of the game um what i really wanted when when the player is in combat it's it's overwhelming and i i alluded to this earlier i'm looking for visual hints well there's a lot of visual hints in in the unspoken and i was like well we're just going to dial up the intensity mm -hmm. and uh um, make sure the player really knows that they're in a in a, in a fight. But yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, said, it's pretty crazy. That said, with the music, there there are four states. So uh, the music starts off in an ambient music state, which is just like a it's kind of just like a preparation for what's to come. It's still what you hear on the album. Um, all of the suites of music. There's I think it says like Blackjack One right. or Blackjack Two. Um, uh, you're hearing all four game states tied together in one oh, piece okay. of music. Oh, okay. I understand. Uh, but but they do include the transition like they do include the transitions as they happen on the fly. So it starts off with the ambient state which is like the you know you're waiting for the battle to start. Then there is a basic battle loop where it's just like hey we're just doing lots of basic attacks. Uh, then there's the escalated uh, battle loop which is just where th it's towards the end of the ra uh, end of the round or end of the fight where things get more intense um, then there's what is called a a summon each arena has a unique summon mm -hmm. which uh, for example is the the ferris wheel turning into the spider um, and that's uh, what I did with that is I slowed down the music to half time um, so if the music is uh, at like 150 beats per minute, which is like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, we're just cutting that into half, going one, two, three, four, um, and whilst the game slows down because you're dealing with something really big, what going, what cutting the time in half allows you to do is uh, add a bit more weight and gravitas to the situation. Oh my God, something big and epic is happening, and I got to deal with it. And then once you've dealt with the summon it goes back into the escalation music um and then you're back to fighting your wizard your wizard opposition again and it's usually the movements are a little bit faster and then there's a win and lose stinger that plays at the end of it's, it um oh go ahead uh but yeah like overall um I, horror is I, there might be a word other than there horror is yeah better, i'm having a hard time like, coming up with it. it's 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 like right on Macabre. the edge of, of horror and it's just very very dark fantasy right. i think is the is is it's kind of like you know the world of pan's labyrinth but like set in the modern world like it's like that's um pan's labyrinth is a little bit more on the fantasy side but like the, just the overall underwriting darkness that is present in in that film um it's it's there in like a modern way in in this game um and I think it's just one of those things that, like, I didn't set out to do that, but it's kind of the way the score went, and Insomniac was super happy with it. So, <laughs> so that's that's go. that's a win for everybody. Uh, <laughs> speaking speaking of another title, Ark. So, so <laughs> I personally feel that uh, of all 
of all the people I've interviewed, um, yours was the easiest to see three distinctively different soundtracks pretty yep. quickly. <laughs> you know, like those. Th I mean, I know you've done more, but I'm saying those bi are big. No, those, those are the three that. Yeah, and they're sure. fairly big titles, like Insomniac, or Ori, and, and Ark. Ark having sold all the copies apparently on Steam. Um, <laughs> when you jump into a game like Ark, and you look at something like that, and you're like, okay, it's going to be cavemen on this you know, raisin dinosaurs, does your brain immediately, and this is something that always comes up in discussions amongst gamers is like, does it immediately go to native, you know, wood, wood instruments and stuff like that? Or is it for you where it's like, I want to sort of shake this up a little bit. Let's do this. Or like, how do you enter that when you first, let's say, looked at it and we're like, oh, this is a game about dinosaurs and dudes running around collecting poop. What am I going to do? Well, I mean, here's the thing. I I know what the actual game is about now because they've come, because they've written the end. <laughs> right. And uh, I think yes, initially on the surface, it looks like a, you know, a, hey, it's prehistoric survival. The game. Um, but what are those giant sci-fi things in exactly, the, in the sky? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and and amazingly, I, I still don't quite know how they did it, but they've they've actually wrapped it up in a pretty cool way. Oh. A lot of people won't ever see the ending because it's really hard to get to the ending. But hey, that's what Twitch and YouTube is for, right? right? Exactly. Um, but like, um, when I initially worked on the game, all they wanted was like, this game is an adventure game. Like you wake up on the island and your goal is to survive, but also I think the goal is to find out why you're there. Mm -hmm. um, like if you look into the story now a lot of people are just playing the game and just doing a survival thing growing their farm of dinosaurs and then they're very and they live everyone lives happily ever after and 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 they don't care about uncovering why they're there um, which kind of is a, maybe a perhaps a metaphor for real life less myself. than 20 people um, <laughs> less than 20 people or 20 percent of people finish their games that's yep exactly so, um and our cast to be like five percent <laughs> oh yeah no, it's probably, probably less probably not even yeah that. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I wanted the, the, the sense of adventure to be the thing that came across in, uh, in the main theme. Um, you know, they, thankfully they were quite explicit about not requiring it to be like Jurassic Park. So like, and, and the core of the arc soundtrack is the game is kind of built around community. So there is a sense of tribalism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there. Uh, a lot of you you can't really have any major success in the game unless you join up with other right. people that's kind of the point yes you can go into single player and you can grind it out for a long time but it, uh, unless you've got well cheats or uh, or incredible patience it's not going to be as fun um so what we've basically done is create a big epic orchestral soundtrack but put tribal rhythms underneath it um like a lot of the the rhythms in the percussion in the score um, are very tribal based, and actually, I would go as far to say as some of them are rooted in modern electronic dance music, mm -hmm. but just transcribed for old prehistoric instruments. Okay. Um, I think I think if you've noticed one thing about Ark, it's not a super serious <laughs> right. game. I mean, we've got sharks with lasers, we've got Iron Man suits, like so. I think that actually gives me a little bit more freedom to have a bit more fun with the music. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, what ended up happening is like the, the soundtrack for the game, basically there's only music, oh, music only plays when you're in combat mm -hmm. um, and there's light mixes and heavy mixes. The light mixes play basically when you're fighting a, an ant or something that will clearly do no harm to you un unless you, you, you've still got to deal with it because, you know, anything can do damage in the game, but you know, you, you're probably going to be okay. The heavy music plays when you're really in trouble, right. uh, which was probably but, why it always played when I played. <laughs> I was right. always in trouble. Um, well, also one of, the, one of the things is like the head, if if you, I don't know when the last time you played was, but in the beginning there was only two pieces of heavy music, like there was only two pieces of combat music that played across the entire. Oh, island, gotcha. Which, which, um, and I'll get onto this in a sec. Which, when I changed that, oh my goodness! Like w when you change something in early access, you have got to be really careful. That that's one of the big lessons I, I've I've learned. Um, I'll go into that in a moment because it is a really interesting topic. Um, Anyway, getting back to the combat music, basically heavy mixes, light mixes, and 
the only differentiator between them is is the music changes based on what biome you're at in the game. Okay. So if you're in the ocean, the ocean combat music plays. If you're in the mountains, the mountain combat music plays, and so on. Um, so it's just to give the game a bit more of a, an environmental feel and make you feel like you're in another place. As for the music itself, I mean, the combat music is pretty over the top and it's pretty epic. But, you know, what can you do when you've got three T-Rexes, a guy in an Iron Man suit, some pterodactyl with a laser turret on it, a boat firing a rocket launch? Like, it's got to be over the top. My approach was to take it over the top. And and look, if it's one of those things where if it's too much, I, I think, you know, you can you can turn down the music. It's okay. I know people who play lots of multiplayer games who don't want any music at all. And it is a survival game. Some people want the true survival experience right. where it's just like sound effects and, and, and ambience. Um, and that's okay. Like, I think with a game like Ark, which is a sandbox game, you need to give the players as many options as right. possible. I think it's difficult to score a game like Ark because everyone has their own personal preferences and there's not really a script. So how do you script something for 10 million players? Mm -hmm. you, you can't. It's the, the script is generated by the players. So what you're doing, you're trying to cover as broad a base as possible. Um, the only part which is scripted is the end game because it's linear and it's the end game. Like, And I had great fun scoring the end game. And on the soundtrack album, the last four tracks on the album are exactly as, uh, as you would hear them, how they progress oh, gotcha, in the game. Gotcha. So, so that was kind of cool to like have my like one like moment where I can actually like tell a story with music because in the game it's, it's not, it's about the stories the player creates. And I don't know what the players are going to create because I'm not telepathic. Right. So I'm just trying to make, it comes back to like writing music for feeling. I'm trying to make the player feel awesome while they're on, while they're riding their T-Rex, shooting the hell out of everything yeah. like that's really the only goal um and and coming back to early access so when we started um there are only two combat tracks in the game and in february this year we did we put in the digital mock-ups for like all of the location-based music in the mm -hmm. game and um we also changed the main theme up a little bit and uh you know the forums go wild like why have they changed the music or they've ruined the music and it's it's not it's not that it's not that the music has been ruined it's just that you're messing with people's nostalgia yeah. um because when you when you've had a piece of music playing and it's associated with a positive experience you've had in the game well you change that to any degree well you're messing with people's memories and this is something i've learned like I, I have to like handle it a little bit better, like on on uh, my f uh, any future early access titles. But who could have known that the audience would fall in love with what I regard as temp music? Right. Like you know, that's the thing with early access. What comes out on day one is subject to change, um, and especially in the case of music, music's one of the last things that ever goes into a game. Yeah. So to have music at the beginning that's regarded as final is absolutely ludicrous to me. But on the other hand, how do you support the people that have invested into the game uh, early on and that are the reason why you kind of have a job in the first right. place? You know, it's like, you know, Ark's still going strong two years later and they're, they've are they finally made it to retail release, which is, you know, it's a big deal for an early access game, especially for a big early access game. Like the fact that they managed to get over the finish line and not have feature creep um, is, is pretty miraculous. Yeah. Um, so... Um, one of the the things I I've realized is that like my my digital mockups are quite good. They they they're quite good at transmitting feeling to the player. But like if I'm if I'm going to do an early access game, maybe I should make them like less good because you know people got become it makes it harder to become attached to music, mm -hmm. or just have less music in the game on the at startup first, of early right. access because the game would have been fine without music with just the main theme at the beginning it would have been totally fine um without music at the beginning and people would have asked for it it's like when's music coming um well it's coming soon um, but i think maybe in hindsight we put a little it, it's either put a lot of music in the game at the beginning and then don't change it around and just maybe improve the production mm -hmm. quality but if you're doing an early access title there might not be the budget for that or scale it way back yeah. um 
but that was that was very interesting a new phenomenon to me i'm used to directors having temp music love like because they've been with a with a track for like you know six months and have edited to it but dealing with an audience that has has fallen in love with your with your with what you regard as temp music is probably the most unique challenge i've faced yet in my scoring career um fortunately the live recording at abbey road yeah the final versions are the definitive versions and since we put them in game there's been no comments so that's like that's nice that like the the thing you know the recording that we you know that was is an expensive recording has turned out to be like the premium version um but you never know until you put it in so it's like and i think with early access gamers feel the same way as the developers it's you know it's been around for a while and enough that we've get we've got some good games but we've also got burned but i think what happens is is it's still a huge learning process for everybody and you know a lot of people wouldn't even assume but i'll tell you for example deus ex the original deus ex didn't run incredibly well on my pc so i heard the menu uh music hundreds of times as it crashed (laughs) and it's so burned in and I love it now and the game worked and I played it and I I absolutely love the game but it's so if you were to go in and you were to say you know hey Carrick I'm just going to add a couple instruments and you played it I would probably hate it regardless because I would be like that's it's so burned in and ARC when ARC released it had some (laughs) issues and uh, I did some let's plays and there were crashes but I was listening to that menu music as I was like, okay, create server, create personal server, do this. And you're, you're in those things. If those things change, I think I can see where a gamer is like, whoa, this is, you're sort of playing with my, with my nostalgia, like you said, and, yep. and who knows how long it'll be nostalgia. I mean, it could be two years in early access, three years. Yeah. I mean, with that, with that main theme, like the, the first version was in since, you know, the very beginning. Yeah. And uh, then I changed it. We changed it in January just a little bit. And it was was not a positive change. I'm like, so the, so the final version, which is the version we recorded at Abbey Road, um, you know, the the production quality and aesthetic is it's kind of like a hybrid between the digital mm-hmm. mock-up and then we've put the abbey road recording like kind of on top of that to like help match things up a bit more so it still feels like the original but like the abbey road sound particularly the trumpets on the final refrain of the theme it just it takes it over the top and takes it beyond what the original gotcha. was but finding that balance was 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 tough like be respectful of the original it's my own music, damn it. I should be able to do it how right. I want. But like, uh, but but like in this case, be respectful of the original, um, but also try to take it to like that final level of quality. Um, and fortunately it worked out good, but yeah, there's uh there's no there's no guarantee it will until you until you release it to the public. So I was a little bit nervous about that one, but it seems to have worked um, out. Um you so you've done, you know, film and stuff like that. What would you say? I mean, I don't want to say which do you like better. So I'll just say, what are some of the positive and, and negatives of both? It sounds like <laughs> negatives might be a director loving his temp music. <laughs> like you just, I, I've actually been fortunate. The directors I've worked with don't really have uh, too much trouble with with temp music love. I mean, uh, I don't mind admitting this. I I ignore the temp music. I I think temp music is kind of dumb. Um, right. The only good thing that temp music offers me is it allow because usually it's been edited to. Mm-hmm. It allows me to establish tempo. Um, so I'll usually follow the tempo of the temp music. The rest of it, I don't care. Oh, okay. Um, in fact, in fact, if you try, I think if you try to emulate the temp music, you're always going to sound like a pale imitation of the temp music. Mm-hmm. So uh, you kind of need to go away and just be do your own the thing. Yeah. Music. Yep. Um, and you know, if if that fails, then so be it. Then 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 you're kind of like in the trap of having to deal with the temp music. But often. I think I feel like my job is to give the director something that they hadn't thought of. Mm-hmm. Like that's why I'm hired, right? I'm, my job isn't to rip off the temp music. My job is to be a composer and actually create something new. Um, so let's do it. Um, so that's what I always ask. I'm like, you know, I, I like to listen to the temp music just to see, like to get into the director's headspace mm-hmm. and talk about it with, you know, talk about it with them. Um, but, you know, I'll often say to them, well, now I understand emotionally what you were going for. Let me do my own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they usually say yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll I'm willing to li- it. It would be a bad director who isn't willing to listen to your own spin on things. Yeah. Um, so um, I think the main difference with film versus games is just the time factor. Games, you're usually on for quite a long time. Uh-huh. Um 
films you're really bought on at the end um and there's an expectation in film like that music is kind of like the last thing the director can use to band-aid their film and and fix a bunch of problems that you can't really can't really be fixed anymore <laughs> right. unless you did a reshoot right. um it's often why the composer is also the first person to get fired on a film oh gotcha um like the first major person because if the if the music isn't fixing the scene well it's clearly the composer exactly yeah. um uh who else's fault could it be um so um yeah the time factor you know i i read a story like a couple of years ago alexandre Desplat did the imitation game in like two and a half weeks or mm-hmm. three weeks or something that's and that's not just composing that's recording as well like it's just an insane amount of right. work um I'm probably equipped to do that. Um, and in fact, I kind of did do it with uh, the Minecraft Chinese mythology expansion uh, from composition to final mix and implementation. Uh, that was four weeks for 72 minutes of music, which was that was pretty that, that was unusual for my experience in games. But that's just when Minecraft comes calling, you just suck it but up. That was say, actually gonna get it that was going to be my next question because uh, so if if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, he it, these are basically the uh, musical compositions for the expansion packs, right? Or for the uh, ex- yeah. yeah. Um, they basically they basically reskin reskin the base game with like for the, so for Chinese mythology, they just reskin it and build build a new map with Chinese themed blocks. So when you get that, uh, like you said, when Minecraft comes calling, that's sort of that's a big deal. It's almost like if Bill yep. Gates were to show up at your house and be all, can you do something? You're all, yeah, I probably can. Yep. Um, yep. When you got it, that to me is, so as somebody who came to Minecraft late uh, and never thought it would be, never thought it would be for me and absolutely yep. love my time in it. With it being so, I guess, at times so sedate and very survival oriented, really like yep. Ark, did you find that it was easy for you to act, even though it sounds like it was a short amount of time. Did you find that it was like easy to jump in and say, okay, I sort of know what I want to do here or because of the timing, was it actually hard? Were you like, Oh man, I like, this is actually difficult. Did you see any road bumps there at all? Or, well, um, they, they, with the lack of time, I, they were really good at directions. Oh, okay. were, and, and also with, with it being Chinese mythology, your palette is kind of like immediately limited right. to, you know, it's, it's a mix of like the classic film score sound with Chinese folk instruments layered on top. That was, that was the approach. Um, but there's a lot of like locations in the game. So the way I get around like writing that much music in a short period of time is to use the locations as inspiration. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, the map in Chinese mythology is based off several mythical locations based on journey to the West. Um, so, you know, I took a skim through the internet and uh, just looked through, looked up these locations online and I'm like, okay, well there's my inspiration. Okay. I kind of know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just to i'll jump to the greek mythology quickly this is a maybe an even better example um that map was less about locations but they really wanted to like have uh, an emphasis on like all of the gods there's a there's like millions of gods in greek yeah, mythology right. um so i'm like okay well each track title is going to be based on a god and what they represented um so the god of farming feels you know quite homely and warm the the god the god of the forge you know i've got the sound of iron in the background Mm -hmm. you know it's again like it's obvious solutions um and in terms of like you, you mentioned how sedate it is um my approach really like they have the overworld which is the most sedate part of right. the game and i was like so those tracks are mostly pretty ambient mm-hmm. um then they have the nether which is and they're like okay use just go a little bit darker here so for the greek for, for the greek nether music i just looked up the gods which kind of did some of the messed up more weird right. stuff um and um yeah i mean for the end um which is the the final part of the minecraft um uh for the end in in the greek mythology i just used Ares, the god of war oh. um, which is completely like it's not sedate at right. all but it's like uh you know it's it's just like it's it, they kind of i was like this is more epic than any minecraft music that's ever been written are you guys okay with this I'm like yeah we love it okay <laughs> no problem i'm happy you're happy uh, <laughs> yeah um yeah, you know, uh, with the um, yeah, and with the Chinese tracks, I think you know we did something. I'm going to look up the track title actually, because then I'll be able to give you a proper answer. Just give me one oh, quick moment totally fine. here. Um, so, 
too many projects. Minecraft OST. Um, yeah, so the the track title for the the Chinese mythology ending is called the Terracotta Army. Oh. I mean, like you know, it's yeah. it yeah. that is on Again, the nose, <laughs> right? It, it's on the nose, but it, like I feel like it's a, an appropriate yeah, solution. Right. Um, so yeah, like it, doing doing that like kind of like helps me get in the zone to write quickly, and and also with with the uh, with the Minecraft soundtrack being like softer ambient music, mm -hmm. like that's kind of my jam. Like that's. Uh, um that's what a lot of the ori soundtrack is i mean when when <laughs> when i initially signed on to do the greek one i was like you guys basically want minecraft greek ori edition uh <laughs> like i think i think that's what i wanted because i got offered that uh three months after ori came oh out. gotcha okay uh, so the i think the sound was kind of in vogue mm -hmm. um certainly certainly within microsoft so because that soundtrack obviously got passed around the corridors of power right. um and uh i think that's kind of what they wanted they wanted like my my ori style because it is it is a style that would work well in minecraft because it's quite withdrawn um but they wanted it greek themed right. uh, the chinese mythology one it's a little less ambient they they let they let me uh, express myself a little bit more it's very very melodic um and it's just the orchestra that we use for chinese mythology is actually quite big it's like uh it's it's six, 60 players oh, wow. which is which is no joke, yeah, no joke um uh, but it's kind of cool that minecraft is also commissioning live music in a game which is known for its you know no it, people who played with it from the beginning know it for its uh calming ambient synth work and and the piano stuff um but one of the nice things about minecraft as well is that they were like we don't want you to sound like you the original soundtrack mm. like go be yourself um make it sound greek make it sound chinese but also be yourself um which was uh, which was and nice. i think we see that in some games whether it be expansions or dlc where sometimes the the composer isn't given that like leeway as yeah. much and so when when you have the ability to sort of say you know somebody's buying 12 15 bucks of dlc or whatever and we're changing the graphics and we're adding characters and we're changing locations obviously you would think that the music would at least somewhat change and i've been surprised by by games that haven't done that um when so so you get done you're working on all this stuff this is something i ask every composer and you walk out your door uh what are hobbies that you have that are in no way shape or form your job related or music related um i mean i've i've already implied that i'm a big traveler but like uh, uh, here's one thing that usually throws people for a loop i am a big sports nut i probably oh, know gotcha. more about american sports than most americans um and that always throws people for a loop because i'm british i know who all the best baseball players are. i could probably name every starting quarterback for every nfl team um and the only American sport I don't follow is ice hockey because I think it's boring. Um, but uh, um, I'm a big soccer fan uh, or like real, real football, as I like to call it, because I'm British. Um, and uh, the sport I really enjoyed in school was rugby. Oh, gotcha. Um, and I'm a big rugby fan, too. Like the problem with rugby is, is that because most of the games take place in Europe, the, the like, kickoff time is like five yeah, right. here. So it's like oh my god i have to get up early but yeah i'm a i'm a massive sports nut i like um my my fiance is my fiance hates sports in comparison she's like why don't you go out and play them and i do play sports from time to time but uh sports for me is it's not just like it's not just about the games i actually like the stories within the games sure. as well like there's usually there's usually some drama to be there had. almost always uh, is yeah yeah. Yes, exactly. So like those moments, like that's kind of like why I'm watching um, as well as the teams that I support. Like I, I always get into it when the teams I support are playing. Um, but it's also, yeah, I guess it's the one time where I feel like I let loose. So I, I'm one of those. I'm, I'm a yeller, unfortunately. I like I'm one of those sad, sad guys that <laughs> yells at my television as if as if the, as you're if affecting the, players are the game. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm clearly changing the yeah. game. I don't do that. I don't do that in bars. Like I, it's it's kind of there's usually enough other people doing that for me in the bars. Like uh, and I've always thought it's a little bit obnoxious. So I try not to do but at it. home. You're, um, you're yeah. in my own home. I, I turn into a different human being. Being. it's like i've become very caveman um especially especially in rugby and american football i'm just like yelling at the television it's it's very bad someone's going to get me on video at some point and put it online and uh, here's 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 the uh here's the ori composer who writes emotional yeah. music going absolutely yeah, nuts. screaming f-bombs uh, at the pittsburgh steelers yep. um I I anything else uh, other than uh, sports 
even though sports can for most people i know sports is like <laughs> eats up 80 percent of their life so, so uh one thing that uh both me and my fiance and several of our friends we are big board game so am I. nuts. Yeah. huge uh we play there was a time like we had we had two roommates uh three years ago um and it became a problem because it was taking up so much time we would play settlers of Catan maybe like two two times like in an evening and you know if you've played yeah, settlers right. of Catan, it it can go on for a while especially if you're playing with the expansions like the cities and knights so we've got like the two expansions that so you, there's base settlers of Catan, then there's the cities and knights expansion and then there's like the seafarers expansion uh-huh. and if you combine them all together you have this huge epic map on which you need a really big table for uh, and those games, like a minimum length is like two and a half right. hours. And often it's way more, especially if you've got good players. Yeah. Um, Cause with the, with the, with the base game, there's a little bit of luck, but with the big game, it becomes less about luck and more about management. Right. Uh, but the one thing I love about board games also um, is that they are actually, I, I should have mentioned this when it came to the, uh, the writer's block thing, because Playing those management style mm-hmm. games like Settlers of Catan, they unlock something in my brain that like just gets me thinking in a different way. Mm-hmm. One, it's like, how can I screw over my fiance? But two, <laughs> of course, of course, <laughs> all my friends. But like, uh, but uh, also, it's it just gets my brain working in a different way because you're, you're you're analyzing the board, you're planning ahead. Like, which there is a lot of overlap with composing. You just don't kind of realize right. it. Um, but I mean, one of the other things is, is like Catan in particular. It's a very, very social game, mm-hmm. um, and and there is a lot of psychology and there's a lot of bluffing and lying and like, oh yeah, I'm totally screwed. Like with all these cards I have, like there's I can't do anything on this turn. Um, my um, my fiance is particularly good at that. But like you know, it's 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 also very it's it, the, the, these board games can be very exciting to play because. Uh, um, you know, someone can win from absolutely nowhere, right. um, from out of the blue. Like they can be nowhere, and then like two turns later, it's like, well, shit, they're gonna win. That's really annoying. And then of course, everyone's trying to gang up on the person that is, is going to win to try and stop them by any means necessary. So there's a constant push and pull. And um, so, so the 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 brain power aspect combined with the you know, hey, it's six people getting drunk at a, a at your at your house playing a playing a board game. Um, I we've spent several, we've lost many, many, many hours um, to, to playing board games. But hey, then there's the other silly games like Cards Against Humanity, which just never gets old. Yeah. So it's uh, um, I, I guess board games are, are, are big hobby. Board games, sports. Um, Beyond that, my life my life is pretty simple because I've got the games and the films and the entertainment and like everything. There's not enough time to do much, much many other right, things. Right, and especially um, so, so you you play some of the same ones I do. I also play like Talisman, Twilight Imperium. Twilight Imperium is like an eight hour game, and we'll have we'll have plastic uh, uh, tables we purchased from like Amazon because our table's not big enough. And you've got all your expansions. And matter of fact, this weekend we have like 12 people coming over and we're uh, some people from the channel and we're just all getting together to play. And it's funny you mention that because a lot of my friends will be all, oh, well, you did when you when you talked about this, you'd used a board game analogy and I don't think you did. And I'm like, yeah, that shit sneaks in. It does, because yeah. even my wife, who I introduced her, she was a card fan, you know, Uno, those kind of things. But when I introduced her to board games, um, this is a hilarious side story, but we I do airsoft, which is very physical out. It's like paintball, but the guns look real and stuff. Yep. And so my wife, who I never thought would like this, I'm like, let's play, let's play um airsoft. And she smoked us. And to the point of people from ex military people were like, What in the hell? Like her uh, her level of thinking is twenty times what ours is. And once I started talking to her, I was like why, how did you know to do this? Like I wouldn't. And she's like, Oh, well, remember in talisman when I went over there to fool you guys. And I was just like, wait, what? I mean, it, it, and yeah. I love that you can get that from a board game. Cause I don't think people see it. I don't, I think no. that people don't Well, no, people, uh, people, I, I think board games are making a comeback. They are. But I still think, I think, uh, it's it, for, for a lot of, for, for much of, uh, the millennial generation, it's still maybe seen a little as a nerdy. Little bit, it's more by people. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit nerdy, but like, I think all you have to do is just 
get convince them to play like one game and especially if, if you've got a good social right. group with you it's it's kind of impossible not to have fun it's but I, I just love seeing couples argue like when it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, do you have a psychologist in the group who can come and like uh, talk I, them I down? I know it's like, it, but it's just funny because because sometimes the couples like team mm -hmm. up, uh, but I think more often it's like, well, hey, this is the one time where I could actually get away with right. doing something terrible, uh, right? Uh, like my favorite thing to do in Catan is just like block like the longest road or something. Just take I I'll, I'll usually go out of my way to to block my fiance on that on that <laughs> pile. Um. Just, just that spike. It, it is funny though, <laughs> also because I do the, sort of the, I guess the the triangle of games where it's like card games, board games, and then role playing. And it is funny though that uh, how how much of that it does it sort of seeps into other things. And it's funny because when I grew up, probably for whatever reason I wasn't teased because I liked video games or whatever. And I know a lot of people were. And now it's so cool to see people embrace it. And yes, there's negatives, obviously around yeah. that. Um, but it is funny when I have a friend who will be playing Madden 17, right? So this is the 17th game that's basically exactly like Madden 1, except looks a little better. Still football. Yeah. And we'll say we're going to role play and he'll be like, oh, that's nerdy. And I'm all, you do realize what you're doing, right? You, you do realize that you're doing literally the same thing, but I can do whatever I want over here. It, but it is so nice to see those coming out. It's nice to see like channels that do board games because I think that it also helps developers too to understand because some developers, yep. when you talk to them, though, they sort of get motor set into a mechanic or whatever. And then a, a, a good game player like yourself, if yep. you're a good board game player, you can jump into a game. And if it's about resource, which is funny, you mentioned that yep. you can end up just destroying the game's balance because you under you're like, yep. oh, well, right at the starting, if I just collect 25 of these, I can get two of these and then that turns into one of these and boom, I'm set. Yep. So yep. Uh, it, it's very cool to hear those mixes. So I like to end these with the occasional game. And so what this one is, is it's very simple. It's just, what do you think when I mention a certain instrument? And so these are, these are very simple instruments, but it's like the first thing that pops into your mind. And it, I, I call it a game, but it's more like just a thought process of, of um, like what emotion you get from it. Uh, anything you've, you've, you've clearly got some like psychological like thing and then you you're like then then you'll be like this person yeah. complete sociopath <laughs> after it's like he mentioned murder in seven of them. no so so for example if i say trumpet uh grandiose yes banjo <laughs> stupid <laughs> oh, oh, oh man oh harmonica Oh boy, I, you've you've chosen two instruments which I hate. So it's like That's uh, harmonica. Fine. Whereas banjo is stupid, harmonica is irritating. Irritating harp. Uh, elf. Now this hasn't been used as much, but I, it, I came. This instrument uh, sort of came into use in like 1970s horror movies and stuff like that. Have you ever heard of a water phone? Yes. What What's that for you? Uh. There's a word I'm looking for, um, but I'm struggling with it. Um, waterphone. Uh, slime. Slime. Okay. And then Casio keyboard. <laughs> Actually, oh, slime or like sewer. Sewer. And then Casio keyboard. <laughs> Entertaining. My, my, the, it's funny because... <laughs> Entertaining in the worst way possible. Yeah, we, got, we uh, got together and we were talking about it on the channel and I asked everybody, I'm like, hey, just throw some throw some in here and I came up with banjo because I just watched Deliverance and I, yeah. I was like oh banjo I want to see what he says and then somebody said Casio keyboard and I said grandma and he's like what and I'm all of all things that's how I learned to play the piano it was my grandmother's Casio hey, keyboard hey, those Casio keyboards they, they're still Dude, going man it's remember uh, getting those they only had back then like seven dials that was it and and yeah. like you'd have the thing where you could do like 27 different you know overall sounds they said they were a flute but really didn't sound exactly like a flute. Right, they don't really sound Nothing different. like a flute. <laughs> I will I will qualify my banjo being a stupid thing. I actually don't mind the banjo at all. It was it, you did say this it, first it, thing to first me it's thing. just a very it's a very stupid sound like but but in context <laughs> with 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 other stuff it's it's very fun. And I I have written for banjo before. It's just uh, but yeah, that, that was the first no, thing that came into my No, head. that's awesome. I mean, I've <laughs> I've had pe I, I like uh I had one composer say never when I mentioned one. I'm like, "What do you mean by never?" And he's like, "I would never use that instrument." I absolutely he's he's like especially as a musician you're supposed to you're supposed to like every instrument but he's like he goes oh, well i it, it bothers I, I will him. take great 
pleasure right now in saying on air that I hate the bassoon. And um, oh, really? well, someone asked me, someone asked me, um, you know, uh, jokingly on Twitter, what's uh, what's one of the things that makes the Ori soundtrack, you know, that, that you think makes the Ori soundtrack like stand out? And I'm like, well, we didn't use bassoon. We used every other woodwind instrument except the bassoon. I mean, it was kind of said in jest, but I'm kind of like half serious. I have used the bassoon since we used, we actually used three on Ark. It has its place. But I think it looks stupid, and I think it sounds stupid. <laughs> it do- it uh, looks uh, dumb like as hell, this, actually. It does. It like next to the bass clarinet. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just like, eh. But but the I now th- here's the thing. I love the contrabassoon because the contrabassoon, like it's so bassy mm-hmm. and so deep. And if you combine it with like other low instruments, it's which we do a lot on yeah, our very the somber. Arc soundtrack a lot of. It's yeah. yeah, it can really add some serious weight. But the bassoon, it's kind of just like it's it's always the joke instrument. <laughs> Please, the comet is like do, 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 right. do. I can't I, I just can't stand it. <laughs> uh the less the less bassoon the better, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I love all the other woodwind instruments, and I think that's kind of proven in the in the Ori soundtrack, especially because I write a ton yeah, for yeah. woodwind. Uh but no, bassoon bassoon doesn't get any love from me. Hey, well, you're you're probably not the only one. I I've got these now cuz uh I'm, I'm going to do some other inter- interviews here s- soon and I want to see exactly what their responses uh are. I want to say first of all, thank you very much and also, you know, is there anything we've talked uh, you know, fairly free form, is there anything that you are upcoming that you want to talk about? Um we discussed prior to the podcast we don't want to talk too much about um uh, about the sequel to Ori. But is there anything that you're working on or anything that you're excited for? Well, the the Ark soundtrack is out on August the eighth, so that whole that whole uh, that whole thing gets really really kicks off in a couple Very of weeks. Cool. So that's that that's imminent, and that that will be available everywhere. You probably won't be able to miss it because they're really good at the marketing mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they are. So. Um, I've got a cup. I've got I got several unannounced projects in the works, but uh, yeah, the only one that has been announced is is Ori two, and 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 that's that's a that's a long way off. But uh, I'm really looking forward to to diving into that world again. Um, one thing um, one thing that was pretty cool is that Microsoft like had us do the live performance at uh, E three. I don't know if you saw that. I did, and I have a question um, from a Discord person who wants to ask you about it, go- but. It basically wanted to say, what was it like performing live on the Microsoft stage? I'll, I'll do a quick answer for that. So the last time I, re- I performed in public was uh, 11 years ago in front of 550 oh. people. <laughs> uh, now, again, I'm a good piano player, so like I know what I'm doing. Um, uh, but when so the way the stage was set up was I'm. I'm rotated onto the stage, mm-hmm. um, whether it's because it's a, it's a turning stage, which is kind of like so it means I don't have to do the whole walk on thing with the potential of falling over. Right. Um, so I'm already set, but like the 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 thing rotates so slowly, and then the audience gradually comes into view. Like, and it's the Galen Center. That capacity is like twelve thousand, yeah. I think. Like, it's, it's no joke. Um, and I can't go into tunnel vision mode until the environment stops moving. So like, I'm just looking around. I'm like, okay, don't make eye contact with anyone. Don't make eye contact with anyone. Cause that's like the moment I'll like start like getting worried and my body temperature will start <laughs> increasing. One of, one of the problems with the, if you, the way to avoid performance anxiety is for, for me is to like not look at anyone. Right. Uh, Cause once you start sweating, once you, once your hands start sweating, then you have the potential to fall off the keys. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, made it through that, but yeah, the last time I recorded was in front of 550 people. This was a packed out Galen Center, but also the numbers on the stream were 12 and a half yeah, million. Yeah, dude, it's insane. Uh, so um, I think what also helped is that I wasn't looking at the video because, I mean, that video is quite heavy. It's quite like, it's quite sad. And it's, you know, there's been reaction videos of people crying, which is, which is nice. Um, I think it might have set me off if like I'd actually been able to see the video um, because you know this is this is you know this is one of my children right. basically yeah yeah for sure um, so uh, yeah it was a it was uh, it was it was terrifying only for the moment that I was being rotated on stage but once once the music starts I'm able to block everything out I'm I'm very lucky in that I've been able to do that like forever I don't really get nervous once once things get going mm. it's just the moments before the waiting um, the waiting to go on stage or whatever that that that's when all the thoughts of terror come in because you know if I screw up that's going to be on the internet forever 
Like that's the kind of thoughts that, that you have. <laughs> yeah. like, if and, and sometimes it might not even be my fault. You know, maybe the microphone doesn't right. work or like, you know, not all of it was in my control, but hey, that's what the six rehearsals were for. Oh, so six. Uh, by by the time by the time we got to the actual event, like all fear had been removed. Yeah. So um and yeah, it was I think like the 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 performance was cool, um, and uh, I, I like that the focus was the video. It's not really about the piano player; it was just like a way to introduce it in a nice way. But then they do one cutaway after that. But overall, the focus rightly should have been on the video. Um, but also <laughs> seeing the reaction from it, it's like, damn, wow, people really do want a second Ori yeah. game. We'd better, not. and we're not we're not the unknown studio anymore. Like, there's there's going to be the expectation this time. So, that I think I'm both excited to dive back in, but also this is the first time I've done a sequel. So, whilst I want to do something new, it's like, how do I combine yeah. the thing that people loved and do something new? But hey, that's these are good problems. To yeah, have, it, and I we all, to solve yeah. Them. Complaining about your Ruby <laughs> slippers being too tight, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Right. we talk about that all the time. It's like whenever I bitch about a video, I'll be all. I should probably just shut up because, it, like, <laughs> I mean, of all the things to worry about. Well, I want to say thank you very much. If you would stick around after uh, this video for just a couple minutes, and uh, we can we can talk about it getting posted. Everybody else, thank you very much for tuning in. We will have links in the description for uh, everything that he has that's out and about, as well as you said, August comes, um, ARC comes out August for purchase. Is it, August. is it pre-order? Yep. Can you pre-order it now? Uh, the soundtrack, no, just, I think the base game you can pre-order, but I think the soundtrack will just go live at midnight on August the okay. 8th and there'll be, there'll probably be a ton of press about okay. it. So. so if you're watching this prior to that, you won't see a link. If you watch it after, I will add it. Thank you everybody for watching. It's been a blast. Thank you again, Gareth, for coming. It's been, it's Thanks been so amazing. And, uh, and everybody remember, uh, official word is that, uh, Banjo is stupid. Peace out everybody. <laughs>